Check, check, check. Uh, all right, everyone, good morning. There we come. Um, happy to be here. This is a bittersweet moment. I'm uh, really excited to be speaking for the second time at Derbycon, but also really sad that it's the last one. Um, I have to say that definitely for me, Derbycon was you know, the best con. I've met so many good people. Some of them I met for 10 minutes. Some of them are still my friends, but they were all cool. Um, and I'm going to miss that. So Derbycon, I'm going to miss you. We'll hope we'll get, we'll, we hope we'll get something similar. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start. Um, so my name is Mauricio, and today I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> adversary simulation and all the benefits that adversary simulation um, has to provide to um, detection engineering programs. Um, in fact, I think, I, I think adversary simulation is so important uh, for detection programs that um, I chose this title, which is, uh, yeah, from the uh, French mathematician Descartes, you know, he said, there, uh, I think, therefore I am. So I'm, I, I simulate, therefore I catch, because so, I think that um, without adversary simulation, we're not really doing detection the right way. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to support this uh, throughout this talk and, and you'll, you'll think this way too. So today I have three main, um, let's say, areas of, of the talk. One, we're gonna do like a quick introduction of just what's simulation, what's detection engineering, and what are the challenges with detection engineering, um, how simulation can help those challenges. Um, then we're gonna go over some recommendations from my perspective to you guys. If you're thinking of integrating adversary simulation to your programs, I'll give you some tips, some things that we do uh, that may you be able to replicate. And finally, I'm going to be um, uh, releasing a tool today um, for, that we've been using internally to build, test, and enhance detection. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to use it and help you uh, on your detection programs, okay? So um, just a little bit about me real quick. I'm originally from Arequipa, uh, Peru. Um, that's a picture of my home city. We have a big volcano uh, called El Misti, and you can see the El, El Misti volcano uh, from pretty much everywhere in the city. Um, I currently live in New York and lead the threat management team at uh, Financial Services in New York. That's my Twitter account, and I always love to connect and meet new people. So come say hi um, if you see me. That's my GitHub where the, the tool will be uploaded. <clears throat> so the, my first DerbyCon talk, I started the talk with a fun fact about Peru. So I kind of want to use this to break the ice again. So are you, I'm going to drop a fun fact about Peru. All right. So who here likes or liked punk rock at some point? Yeah? So me, as a teenager, I really liked punk rock. I got into it uh, through a friend, and I really liked the music, you know, the mosh pit, the re rebelling against authority, your parents, uh, school. Um, and, but I, I still like the music a lot. And when you read about punk rock and uh, its origins, you, you always come back to these two bands, the Sex Pistols and the Ramones in 74 and 75. Uh, but locally in Peru, going to the bands, the local bands and the local concerts, I always heard about this band called Los Psychos, which actually was from 1964, so 10 years before um, the Ramones. Um, and their music was really something similar to punk rock. Um, and, um, and we, I grew up thinking that you know, the Psychos was maybe one of the first punk rock bands. Uh, and in fact, a few years later, there's a few media outlets that started uh, talking about this and a few, uh, a few um, uh, rock um, historians, I guess, or uh, were talking about this. So, so yeah, uh, that's the fun fact. Um, punk rock may have started in Peru. Um, and if you wanna know more about it, you can check this um, documentary. All right, All right. so we'll go ahead and start. Uh, Cool, so I wanted to start this talk by talking about where are we as a blue team in 2019, uh, from my perspective. So the first, uh, go blue team. So the first, uh, the first, uh, <laughs> the first uh, point that I wanna make is uh, in 2019, uh, we understand, blue team understands that prevention has fallen short. It's not gonna work. There is no one single tool that is going to be able to stop all the attacks. As much as machine learning and AI and deep learning they have, there's, it's not gonna work, it just doesn't work, right? Um, and we, we understand that we need to be improving detection. Uh, so we, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't deploy prevention controls. They, they have a, a room in the whole security program, but once we deploy the basic security foundations from a prevention perspective, we should be focused on detection. The next point is we assume compromise. So we know that attackers are gonna get in. It's not a matter of uh, if, it's when, right? Um, 
Um, <clears throat> but that, that should, I think that that shouldn't uh, demoralize us because getting access, getting an initial foothold, it's only the beginning, right? It, there, it takes some effort and steps to be able to achieve operational success. And the attacker doesn't know your environment. You, we know our environment. So we kind of kind of use this on our uh, advantage uh, to build uh, an environment where we can um, where we can uh, set traps in the environment and catch attackers as they're doing their operation. Um, we are logoholics. We understand that um, uh, attackers are going to get in, and we need to detect them. And for to create detection programs, we need data. So we're bringing all these data in. Uh, host data, network data, application data, right? And we're centralizing it to an event pipeline going to your central location. This could be as simple as a SIM, right? Or this could be more complex as, as a data lake in Apache Spark, you know, you name it. It could be really complex, but really simple. But at the end of the day, we have the same. We have all these data and we have some kind of analytic platform so that we can run queries on, right? We, can, we now use this data to develop custom analytics. So we're no longer just deploying tools and waiting for them to work and alert and do something, right? We're, we're going into our data and making, creating these analytics uh, based on our environment, custom to us, that will help us detect some patterns of, uh, of attacks, right? And also in 2019, uh, we speak adversary, right? Uh, I feel that the, the MITRE attack framework is a really great tool to that gives us one single taxonomy that we can use to measure programs based on actual uh, 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 techniques that attackers use in the wild. And that also, it also allows us to collaborate between other blue teams because we're speaking the same taxonomy, right? Um, so, um, okay, so I feel that also, in um, 2019, uh, Blue, Blue Team is building the attacker's playground. And I borrowed this term uh, from Jessica Payne, uh, who uh, wrote a blog post in 2017 about this. Um, and she mentioned four main principles. And it's a great, I highly recommend you go and read in this. Uh, however, I'm not going to talk about that particular, the way she sees it. I'm going to just use that, uh, the term, and kind of explain it from my own view. Um, so as we, we've, we've uh, talked about in the last five minutes, um, Initial access is only the beginning, right? And it takes effort and uh, time and several steps for an attacker to achieve operational success. And these steps, oh, this process allows us, provides us detection opportunities. And what I want to mention in this talk as traps. The more traps that we deploy in our environment, detections, it, the more likely that for an attacker to trip one of them. And they only need to trip one, and we may catch him, right? And you probably all heard this phrase, uh, as I started my career, I always heard it. Attackers only need to be right once, defenders only uh, have to be right all the time, right? Well, I'm telling you, we're turning the tables. Now, defenders only need to detect once. Attackers just need to make one mistake and we'll catch him. Because remember, the goal is not to uh, prevent initial, the initial foothold. The goal is to prevent uh, operational success. Um, and we can catch him as they're trying to get to that goal, that target data. And I think that a big part of the attacker's playground is detection engineering. Um, and from my perspective, detection engineering is the, um, the continuous process of deploying, tuning, and operating detection analytics with the goal of finding threats, right? So we're using all these data that we're gathering from our host network application data um, and building new detections, enhancing them, testing them, making sure they're operating, they're working. Um, and this is how I see the attacker's playground, right? We have a combination of both prevention controls and detection controls all over our environment, right? Um, and all these data is being centralized to an event pipeline to your SIM, your data lake, whatever it is that you may have as that central location. And we have a few important steps like ingestion, transformation, where we're Standardiz standardizing that data to make sure that we can query it the right way across multiple data sources. Uh, we're indexing, and then we have some kind of analytic platform that allows us to run queries on this data and create detections, right? This is important. Without this, we have no detection programs, right? So this is kind of like a prerequisite. Um, and the way I see it, as we build our, the attacker playground, as we build on our detection engineering programs, we look something like this, where we're setting all these traps in the environment. And as you can see right here on the um, uh, lower left, you know, an attacker may get an initial foothold, 
um, chore, uh, but they need to get operational success and grab data from the data center maybe. And as he's doing his operation, the attacker is doing the operation, he may set a uh, trip one of our traps and it only takes one and you have a, a proper process. Um, we may catch him before they achieve success, right? Um, however, I think that detection engineering and um, the attacker's playground have a lot of challenges. And I want to talk about four challenges. Um, the first challenge um, is, you know, you have a bunch of prevention controls, which makes sense to have, and we should have them. Um, but how do you know if they're working? Um, when was the last time you checked that your firewall is blocking 22 outbound? Or when was the last time you checked that your proxy is actually blocking certain categories, right? Or is your anti-malware solution blocking the right things, right? Um, second challenge is we have all this data. Awesome. How do we build detection if we don't have proper attack telemetry, right? How do we know what's a bad, known bad, what's a, a bad pattern? Um, number two, uh, uh, three uh, in challenge is going to be um, detection resilience. Um, how do we know if that, that one detection that you have for that one attack technique um, is really resilient and is going to detect all the variations of that same attack? You may have a full sense of coverage if you think, yes, I have a detection for credential um, um, dumping. Um, but what if the attacker uses a different technique instead of reading ELSAs, right? Um, and the last one is, how do we know there's always changes in our environment, right? Firewall changes, um, reboot windows, patching. How do we know if one of those changes didn't break our event pipeline in some way, right? What if your branch office in Singapore um, has somehow gotten a bad firewall rule and is no longer sending events to your SIM? All these challenges, I feel, can be approached with adversary simulation, right? Uh, just simulating attack techniques uh, to make sure that, oh, that the event pipeline is working, that your detection is resilient, um, and that your process is being followed, so your SOC is pro properly following uh, the process. So I think I'm going to focus on three goals. Confirm prevention controls are working. Generate the attack behavior to telemetry to build, test, and enhance custom detection. And finally, identify gaps in visibility, right? Those are all the ways that I feel adversary simulation can help you in building your attacker's playground and in deploying detection engineering programs. Uh, but how? Sure, Mauricio, this makes sense. How do we do this? So I want to give you some tips of a few things that we do, um, uh, and um, hopefully they, they make sense to you and you can implement it. I think that the, the very first thing that you want to do um, is uh, make sure that your prevention controls are working. I'm not going to focus too much on this because this talk is about detection. But what I would recommend doing is just go to your, you know, go to a whiteboard, uh, whiteboard and just start enumerating all your prevention controls at the host level, at the network level, and prioritize them. What's most important for you? And then come up with uh, simple ways of testing this. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be too complicated. It can be manual initially. Um, you know, IPS, just you can do a WGET to a particular URL with a particular path that it has to, uh, it's going to trigger a, a rule and hopefully block it, right? Or memory protection, you can run in, in both community cats from a, a high privilege um, PowerShell shell and it's going to work, right? So, um, yeah, test your prevention controls. Make sure they're working. Um, but if we move to uh, detection, this is kind of the process that we use to build in detections. Um, so first, you identify the technique of interest. Um, so this could come from um, you know, the MITRE attack framework. This could come from a threat report that uh, Mandiant releases from a particular threat actor that you're interested. Or this could come from a tweet from Matt Graver on something that he's uh, uh, you know, playing with in the weekend. Um, you, and you know, of course, this, this technique has to be of interest to you, right? There, it has to be some kind of um, uh, importance to you. Um, the next one is you design the simulation scenario. So um, in, this er in this phase, what you're going to do is uh, just learn more about this technique, really understand it, understand the scenarios and how it can be implemented, um, and then um, figure out what tool are you going to use to simulate it. Can you use an open source tool? You have to, can you, do you need to write your own? Uh, is it even possible to simulate this, right? Um, 
Then once you figure that out, you're going to execute that simulation. Um, you assess coverage, see if you have that. Uh, uh, the most important question to ask is, do I have centralized telemetry for this type of simulation, right? Because if you don't, you have to go back and correct that visibility. This could mean a GPO change because you're not logging a particular event ID, or this could be a new span session uh, from your firewall because you're not sniffing that part of the, the network, right? Um, so you go back, you figure out how to uh, and correct that visibility gap, you execute the simulation again, assess coverage, now you have the data in, and you ask yourself, do we have a detection for it? Uh, the first time, probably you probably won't have a detection for it, but at this point, we're good, because we have all that data, so we can compare that um, known bad pattern with the known good. So you can hopefully build a detection analytic and create a, a detection for this. You go back, simulate, and then you, uh, you now you have a detection trigger, which is good. Um, however, I don't think you should stop there. You shouldn't assume, okay, I have a detection for this technique, I'm done, let's move on to the next technique. Um, I think that we need to validate detection resilience. This is really important. I think that the same technique, we need to be able to simulate in different ways, because that technique can be implemented in different ways by attackers, and then that may look different on the logs, and you may have a false sense of coverage. Um, and let me give you a simple example, password spraying attack, right? Um, let's say your purple team, your red team, runs this tool against you, uh, this password spray attack uh, by DAF hack, um, and you're running it from a Windows domain, uh, uh, domain joint host from PowerShell. Um, when you do this, this is actually using Kerberos and uh, trying uh, one, one uh, password per user, right? And you make it easy to create a detection based on that, based on the 4771 event ID, which we're gonna take a look at in a little bit. So you may think, okay, I'm done, password spraying, I got this. But what if, what if we do something like this, where you're no longer using a, a Windows do domain joint host, you're using like a rogue device in the environment that has got some kind of physical access, you're not using NTLM, sorry, you're not using Kerberos anymore, you're using NTLM, and you're no longer targeting the domain controller, you're targeting like a server. Um, so this looks completely different on the logs, uh, right? And that, that first detection that you had for the first one is not gonna work. Um, so that's why I think we need to be simulating different variations of the same technique. Um, another important thing that we use simulation is to measure detection maturity. So we came up uh, with a maturity um, matrix, if you want to call it like this, for each simulation, uh, each detection. So as we build our detection, uh, maturity level zero is the simulation does not generate events. So this is where we have no data, right? We cannot detect this technique, so we need to go back and enable logs, enable network sniffing, or maybe uh, buy a tool because you don't have visibility, right? It could be anything. Uh, maturity level one is when the simulation generates events, but they're local. So we cannot use them in, um, in a, um, in, we cannot use create detection for this because they're local on that host, so we cannot use them for a detection program. They need to be centralized. Uh, maturity level two, simulation generates events, and then they are central, in a central location, but there's no detection for it. Uh, so this is when we need to go and build that detection. Um, and finally, simulation triggers a detection, which, um, you get you in a better spot, a maturity level three, and maturity level four, the simulation triggers the detection, but also triggers the proper response process. I think this is important. Simulation doesn't only help us test um, if the detection is working and it's resilient, it can also help you test if the whole process is working. You know, is your SOC elevating the right level of uh, alert, critical alerts, to the right place, right? Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they following the playbooks? And you can do this with simulation. Um, and I couldn't get this uh, for, the, for the, this morning, but imagine a nice um, graph where you have detections and maturity across time. Uh, this could be something cool that you can show to your management, right? As, and one thing that we do is we have weekly validation tests. And we, we have our junior analysts go through those validation tests and go through each one of the detections that we have, um, mapping to attack or sometimes not. Um, we do this weekly and we put that maturity level on, on that for that week, right? And as we go through time, as your detection engineering team is fixing these visibility gaps, is fixing these detection resiliency issues, you're gonna get better and better, right? Um, yeah, and the next step that you wanna do to take it to the next level is definitely start using automated adversary simulation uh, frameworks and tools like uh, Atomic Red Team, MITRE Caldera, 
I wanted to go deep, uh, go into this a little bit, and then I was, as I was go, um, searching online, I found this really cool talk, which actually takes these three and just analyzes them from different perspectives. So I'm going to point you to that to kind of learn more of the uh, atomic rate or mitre caldera. Uh, this is a really cool talk uh, from um, this year. So now I want to talk about my tool and what we've been doing. What I, this is what we've been using internally to test, to build, test, and enhance our detection, and hopefully it's going to help you do the same. Um, okay, so this is kind of like um, this, the next version of a previous tool that I uh, wrote for uh, besides uh, Baltimore um, uh, called Purple Spray, which is focusing on, on, on password spraying. But uh, now I moved from Python to C Sharp to kind of be more native. So these are the, the requirements that I had uh, as, as I was building this tool. So I want to simulate TTPs, right? But I don't want to focus on atomic things like running MSHTA or running regsvr32.exe, right? I want to focus on behavior, right? Um, so that was one requirement that I had, behavior um, simulations. I want to implement the same technique in different ways, as many as I can, so I can make sure that there's, uh, my detection is resilient to all these variations of the same technique. I want to target run, uh, random hosts on the network. This is really important, right? Because this is going to help me identify visibility gaps. If I run a lateral movement technique against the same server every week, are you really testing your coverage, right? What if that small branch office in you know, Europe that you have somehow is not properly sending your events? The only way of knowing that is simulating attacks against random hosts and making sure that the events are coming in uh, from any host in the environment, right? So this is really important. So that's why my tool needs to pick random hosts always. Um, it's not weaponized for now. So, you know, for example, even though I create a remote service, I don't start it or execute it. I just create it and delete it, right? Uh, but eventually, we could, we, could do so, we could make it more to the red team. Uh, um, where possible, use 30, uh, Windows API calls, because this is kind of a selfish requirement. I just wanted to learn more about using um, Windows API calls from C Sharp using platform invocation services. So I just see, I wanted to see what simulations I could do with uh, Windows 32 APIs. Um, and then I wanted to have one single binary, you know, no extra infrastructure, so there's not going to be a C2. It's just one single binary that I can drop and just double click on, and it's going to execute a random technique, right? Doesn't need extra uh, any, anything else. It doesn't even need to have parameters as user and password because if you run it in the context of a user, it's going to grab that user context and do the LDAP queries, uh, so I don't need to pass passwords or put passwords in. Um, okay, so this is, and I'm calling this purple sharp. Um, so this is a beta. Uh, so right now, um, this tool executes arbitrary behavior with the purpose of generating known bad telemetry, right? To help you build, test, and enhance your detection. And I'm mapping my, my simulations to the attack, attack MITRE uh, framework. Um, uh, um, I, I, think, I think I support like nine or 10 uh, simulations now. Um, so basically, even in my code, I use the attack uh, tactics. Uh, um, it's in C Sharp, .NET 4.5, and the code ha uh, is up actually right now, um, so you can play with it. So let me walk you through some demos. Um, now, when I did my first DerbyCon talk, um, my friend Jason Lang um, helped me uh, uh, on the talk, and he told me, "Hey, you need to tell a story." So I want I want to tell a story about uh, Purple Sharp. So and every story has a character. So I needed a character. So I was googling online, just let's see what kind of character what I can get, and I found this book. Bob and the Cyber Llama. So, yeah, um, I'm going to use the Cyber Llama as my character. <laughs> okay, so here's the story. The Cyber Llama just got a job starting the detection year program at ACME. Okay? ACME has spent the, put, the past 12 years building the attacker's playground. So the Llama doesn't have to come in and make sure that events are coming in, the event pipeline, the analytics platform, that's all done. So the Cyber Llama, all, all he has to do is just create detections. And the Cyber Llama has heard about adversary simulation and Purple Sharp. So let's see how the Llama is going to use Purple Sharp to create detections. All right. Uh, so the first thing that the Cyber Llama is going to do is going to go back, take a look at the Pentest report from 2018, and just see what, what techniques were implemented by attackers. Uh, so, and this is not all the, the Pentesters did last year, but you know, this is some of the techniques that the, the Cyber Llama wants to create detections for. So let's go over that. So attackers got in through a fish. They did some power spraying. Um, 
that, that got them some accounts, but nothing privileged. So they moved on to the next technique. They did a network share enumeration, just looking for open shares. And that got them something interesting. They found a, 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 web fo a, web, a folder with a web.config file in it with some creds. So then they used these creds to execute the, te the privileged enumeration technique, which is just spraying that account across the domain and seeing where that account is a local admin, right? Uh, but that didn't get them anywhere. So they went, went ahead and did a curve roasting attack. Um, and then that got them an account. They did a spray again, privilege enumeration. They found that that account was a, a lot admin of a few hosts. They moved laterally using WinRM and WMI, and they got access to the target data, right? So, okay, let's simulate this with the purple sharp. So how can purple sharp help us do this, okay? So purple sharp supports simulating password spraying attacks, okay? Um, and the way I see it is, I broken down password spray into two, into two categories. The first one is what I call local domain spray. So this is when the, the attacker is just validating credentials on that, lo on that host and just talking to the main controller, right? He's not talking to other hosts in that network, right? So for this, I use this Windows API, logon user. Um, now, the, cool, the, the two cool parameters that I, uh, I want to use uh, is uh, logon type and logon provider. So the, the logon provider actually allows you to pick if you want to use Kerberos or NTLM, which is pretty cool because I can you know, iterate and run different simulations using Kerberos or NTLM just to see how the logs look like, in the, um, right? if they look different at all. The second one is logon type. I'm not using it right now, but I think it's pretty interesting because this logon type parameter actually maps to the logon type of the 4624 uh, event ID. So you could actually, and this is interesting for red teamers maybe, because you could actually fake a network, uh, network logon without actually being a network logon, because you can, you can just put type three there and the 4624 is gonna have three. So it is interesting. I, I don't know why they would expose this, but I'm not using it right now. I just thought it was interesting. So the second spray that I, um, I, I call is, I call it the network domain spray. And this is going in, no longer against the domain controller, but actually going against hosts on the network. Right? and spraying them, like, um, like a server or a workstation, spraying accounts against them. Uh, and for this, I use this Windows API. Uh, and this Windows API is used to uh, map uh, network shares. So I just use that to try to authenticate, and if it works, you know, the credential is valid. Um, now, another, and the important parameter here, I think, is the resource, because if I put the FQDN, it's going to use Kerberos, and if I use the IP address, it's going to use NTLM. So once again, I can uh, play with those different variations using Kerberos or NTLM to, to ma make sure that the detection is resilient, right? Okay, so, um, all right, so a spray attack needs to target users, right? So I wanted to have different ways of targeting different, uh, targeting different users. So um, I have different uh, parameters for targeting different users. So um, what I call net, net neighbor domain users or foreign domain users. So what I do is I query the logon server, which so the domain controller where you are authenticated to, and I use this LDAP query to grab users, make sure that the bad password account uh, LDAP attribute is lower than three, because so, I don't want to log accounts out, and also last logon, because I want to target active users, not disabled users or old users, right? And I also use this LDAP uh, query to just take out any disabled accounts, so I want active accounts. Um, so domain, the neighbor domain users, I go to the logon server and I create this query. For the foreign users, what I do is I get a, a list of all domain controllers, I randomly pick one domain controller and grab those. So that way I can target users that may not be on the, your same region, they could be logging into different domain controllers. So I just wanted to see if that makes any, you know, if it, it, it's a difference, it's a different variation, I just wanted to target random users, right? I also can target disabled accounts. This could be interesting because what if the attacker has had access to old disabled accounts and now he's trying them, right? If you have detection for someone trying to use disabled accounts, that could be interesting, right? So why not build a variation for this? Password spraying against disabled accounts. Um, sensitive groups, you know, I use this LDAP attribute uh, to get a list of users that are either domain admins or part of the protected users group, so they're probably admins. And finally, I use, the, I use this LDAP query to get domain admins. Um, and this is a cool one, random users. I want to generate uh, authentication events for users that don't exist in the environment. Why? Because once again, attackers, you know, they make, make a mistake. They may make a mistake. What if they're trying a user list from another victim or something else? So once again, this is a trap, right? We're setting all these small traps in the environment, uh, and hopefully if they make one mistake by maybe using a wrong user list, we'll catch it, right? Um, Okay, and then how do I target uh, hosts? So if you remember, I want to target random hosts in the environment. So I have the same concept. I use this LDAP query uh, to make sure that hosts are, are alive. Um, 
And domain neighbors, once again, I just grab the login uh, server, so that domain controller where I'm authenticated to, uh, and just get a list of servers. Um, and then foreign domain neighbors, what I do is just grab a randomly picked domain controller and I ask that question. So in that case, I'm going to be able to grab uh, targets from a random network in my environment. Right? From maybe that small branch office or that small data center, I can grab any target uh, randomly, always randomly. Uh, random server host, this one I don't like uh, that much, but it's basically what I do is I grab a randomly picked domain controller, I grab the IP address, and I just attack that class C, so the, the neighbors. I assume that the domain controller is always going to be on the server range, which may not be right, but I thought that why not this one. And then network neighbors, I do leak, leak like that, this one. Um, what this does is just queries the network interfaces, uh, calculates the subnet, and then grabs the network, um, your network neighbors. So that way, if I run my simulation tool in my branch office, it's going to target that same, um, that same uh, office, right? Okay, so password spraying. Let's see how this works. I have a few parameters here. I'm not going to mention all of them. Uh, um, the most important is for the network domain spray, I have type 1 and type 2. So type 1, is gonna, what it's going to do is going to grab a random host and spray it. But type, so just one. And type two is interesting. What it does, it's going to grab 10 users. You're going to grab well, how, how, how many users you want, right? Let's, let's say 10. 10 users. It's going to grab 10 random hosts. And it's going to authenticate one to each. So one user per host. So like in a distributed spray attack. I wanted to see how that looks, uh, how different that looks on the logs also. Because uh, that could be, that could bypass your detection, right? And I also support like a sleep. If you want to do like a slow attack, for example, uh, you can pick the number of users. So anyway, let's go to the first demo. And I cannot see the screen, so hopefully you'll you'll see uh, what I'm showing. Um, let's see demo one. Okay, are you you see this? This can you see it? Cool, thank you. All right, so. So I'm purple sharp, technique, local spray, number of users, five. So and it, it just gives you some data of targeting, who's targeting the domain controller. And it's just going to give you, you know, one thing I like, it gives me the timestamp so I can go back and correlate to my logs when this happened, actually, right? So it's trying Kerberos, and it, it gives you the error code. So one cool thing, if I run this again, it's actually going to target different users, right? Because I'm always randomizing to minimize the risk of locking someone out, right? So as you can see, this is using Kerberos. So if we go to the logs, the Cyber Llama, now this is the Cyber Llama doing this, right? So the Cyber Llama runs Purple Sharp, goes to the logs, goes to the main controller, finds interesting events, 4771s. And this happens when someone tries to get a, a TG. and fails with a wrong password. So cool, we can use this event to create a detection for, 47, for a password spraying, right? So that's an easy one. But once again, what if the attacker uses uh, NTLM? So in my case, all you have to do is slash prod2, and it's going to use NTLM. Uh, and then in this case, I'm going to use different, uh, different users, users5. Uh, so that's, I think that's uh, domain admin. So, so yeah, it grows domain admins from LDAP. It gets them, and it tries to authenticate with one password using NTLM. If we go to the domain controller, now we see something different. We don't see 4771s. We see 4776, which is the event that gets generated on the domain controller when uh, a log, uh, an NTLM um, authentication is used against an account. And you don't get an IP address anymore like the 4771. You get a, a source workstation name, which is, you know, it still works, but I think the IP would be better. Um, but that's, we can still use this to create a detection, right? So we have two types of detection so far, right? So now we're going to do something interesting. We're going to use a different type of user here. Um, and we're going to sleep two seconds. Why not? Um, so it's going to wait two seconds between each authentication event. And in this case, we're targeting disabled users, as you can see. So if you remember what I said is, I want to create this detection because I think it's interesting who's using disabled users in my environment. I want to know. I think it's an interesting detection. It shouldn't happen that often. Um, and if it's happening, something's broken probably, right? So in this case, you, know, you see a 4768 and the result, result code of um, tw uh, 12, 12 hexadecimal. So this is interesting. We can use this uh, correlation of events and result code to see who's using disabled uh, users. And finally, um, I'm going to use random users just to see how that looks like on the logs. So I do that, generate five random users. Uh, it generates, now this is a bug on the code. It's supposed to create different user every time, but I didn't want to go through the demo again, so, so I'll fix that. But anyway, you go back to the logs, and now it looks completely different. You see a 4768, but the result code this time is um, 0x6. 
right? So once again, I've learned a lot from Kerberos events, from in, um, in NTLM events. So let's move on to the demo number two um, for network spray. So if you remember, network spray is going to spray uh, not longer domain controller, but random host in the environment, okay? So I'm going to use protocol two for NTLM. Um, it's going to randomly pick a host, in this case, Windows 10-2, and it's going to spray it with five users, right? Okay, that's cool. So uh, we can, if we run this again, once again, always random and with a sleep. Um, I actually, uh, the tool actually targets this time a different uh, host. It's going to target, if it comes back, you see how it targets Windows 7-1, right? So it's always picking random targets. Um, um, so if we go back to the logs, this is NTLM. So what you see on the logs on the host, not, no longer on the domain controller, what you see on the logs of this Windows 7-1 is you see 4625 events. And 4625 gives us the source IP address, the user, the source workstation. So this is a cool event that we can use to, to build detection, right? I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, to do, OK, this is type 2. So this is the distributed attack, right? So you're going to see on the logs um, how the purple sharp is distributing the attack and testing one user per computer, right, in a distributed way. Because uh, that may look different on the logs. That may bypass your detection. So why not simulate it, right? Um, OK, and, and uh, all right, here's a really cool thing that I learned recently, is that on the, on the host where the, uh, the spray is, uh, is originating, right, you see an interesting event, 4648. And this event happens when you're trying to use explicit credentials to authenticate, right? Now, this event is really cool but it because it gives you the user that tried this and the user that you're trying to authenticate as. And it also gives you the host you're trying to connect to and even the port that you're trying to connect to. So it's pretty cool. So now we can use a detection on the receiving end of uh, the attack, but also on the origin. So you can detect if, an inf an, if a computer is infected through this detection, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, so we can build detection for this. Uh, so I'm going to fast forward because I think um, I show what I wanted to show, go back to the slides. And um, OK, so takeaway. The Cyber Llama really understands event logs now. We know what happens with Kerberos. We know what happens with NTLM. I'm not going to go through this because we don't have enough time. But you know, we, we, we are now understand how authentication works, see, looks on the logs, right? Um, and the Cyber Llama has a few new detection analytics. It's going to use the 4771 to detect uh, Kerberos-based uh, password spraying, 4776 to detect NTLM-based uh, password spraying, and why not the 4768 with result code TRX12, which is going to trigger if someone uses disabled accounts. Right? I really like this one because this shouldn't happen on the environment. Um, so, yeah. And then also we've learned that non-existing accounts also create its own type of result code, um, and my tool is able to simulate that. So maybe this is going to be too many false positives because users are always going to type in their username wrong, and that's going to generate uh, this type of event. But maybe in, you can create a baseline, and maybe you can use this as a detection potentially, right? But this should not go into production because it generate generate a bunch of false positives. Um, OK, and going back to the 46 for the network spray attack, now we're going to use 4625, log on type 3, grouped by the source network address, the, the IP address of, of the, the, the attacker, where unique account name bigger than threshold. So we have one extra detection on 4625, and one again for 4648, which is going to detect uh, from the origin someone spraying accounts uh, across the network. Um, now, we've also learned something interesting on 4648. We have the target server name, the IP address, the target port. So maybe there's two extra detections that we can build at some point. You know, event 4648 and subject username different than target username. This is interesting. When is a user going to use different credentials to authenticate? Maybe your sysadmins will, but is Anna from HR ever going to have a second account? Probably not, right? So that's another trap. Um, and this is a cool one. What if you create 47, 4648 where and the computer account is not an, the administrator's group, and the user that is, they're trying to authenticate is an administrator. So why would, and, and again, Anna in HR try to use the domain admin credential, even if it doesn't have the password? So that's an extra detection, right? What if the attacker makes a mistake and you know, types in a wrong password, and we can catch him, right? So, OK. So let's move on to the next, uh, to the next uh, simulation. How are we on time here? OK. Um, Network share. Okay, so net, 
I use this Windows 32 API NetShare Enum uh, to enumerate network shares. And I, the privilege enumeration is I, when, when an attacker wants to know if he's a local admin on that remote host. So I use this Windows 32 API, which is the same API that uh, PowerView uses uh, for the commandlet uh, find local admin access, I think it's what it's called. Uh, so all right, demo three. Um, so this case, uh, boom, OK. Cool, so we're gonna use network share share enumeration. Uh, we're gonna pick random hosts and it's gonna successfully enumerate the shares. It doesn't print them back, it just enumerates them based on the Windows 32 API result code. Um, and uh, I'm gonna purge the Kerberos tickets. All right, here's, here's something interesting that I learned. Um, so it's doing network share enumeration, a bunch of hosts, right? But here's something interesting. When you're doing this, when you're trying to authenticate to several computers, you're actually gonna get a service ticket for, and the service name is the computer account. So it's, this is interesting, as an attacker or as, or as a sysadmin is going to authenticate to a bunch of hosts using Kerberos, it's first going to get service ticket for all those computer accounts and then connect to the servers. So we could use this as a detection as someone's trying to spray or, or, or uh, authenticate to a bunch of hosts, maybe moving laterally or running Bloodhound, right? Um, so that's a cool one. And uh, I also see a 5140 file share access, and you get the IP address, uh, and then you get this share, IPC dollar sign. So this is when you're enumerating the shares. So this is another way that we can detect this. Um, I'm gonna move on, uh, kind of go a little fast forward here um, in the interest of time. So privilege enumeration. So what this is gonna do is gonna call that API to make sure that if I'm an admin or not in this host. As you can see, this user is an admin on a couple of hosts, not all hosts. If I run against the entire environment, I find like I'm an admin on a few hosts. So if you go to the logs of this host, you see another event, 4656, uh, uh, and a handle to an object was requested. And um, in this case, it's gonna be really easy to detect because the object server is SC manager, uh, service control manager, and the access mask is uh, what we uh, sent on that request on the parameter uh, for the Windows API call. So you can use this as a detection when someone's trying to uh, enumerate where their local admin's in, right? So uh, CyberLama is happy. Now we have more detections. We can use that 4769 to, uh, uh, to detect when someone's trying to access several hosts on the network. We can use that 5140 to detect when someone's enumerating shares across the network. And we can use the 4656 to enumerate, uh, to identify when is someone's trying to enumerate privileges on a host. Now, one thing that I like is, this is really similar to how Bloodhound works, right? Bloodhound uh, is going to uh, connect and make API calls to all hosts of the environment. So when Bloodhound rounds, it's also gonna uh, get 4769 service uh, tickets for all your domain hosts and then connect to each one of them use and you can so for, with these two events this is how we catch bloodhound at least at least on the uh, you know the uh, the, uh, the default parameters uh, okay and last demo uh, this is for curve roasting and lateral movement um, Ooh, it was playing. Um, okay, so Kerberos, and for here, for this technique, I'm not using Windows 32 APIs, I'm using uh, Rubius from Will, uh, from SpectreOps, um, and I'm just basically copying his code, thank you, Will. Um, and you can sleep, you know, a few seconds if you want to make it like a, like a slow attack. Um, at some point, I also wanna add a different version of this that's gonna just uh, curve rows one, uh, not all of them, uh, but that's just a simple variation that we can add. And this is easy to catch. This is a 4769 service ticket, and, and where the service name is no longer your computer, but the service name is actually the service account that, uh, that associated with that SPN. So we can create a, det a detection for this, easy. Um, all right, so this is remote service. So this is actually gonna use the create service API to connect to a host and create a remote service and then delete it, right? So as you can see, this user is admin on a few hosts, so he was able to do that. Uh, so if we go to the logs uh, on a few hosts, you'll see this uh, super, legit, uh, super legit update service created, uh, event 7045. So we can simulate if an attacker is doing like PSXEC or, or Metasploit PSXEC, right? Uh, without weaponizing it, so um, you can we can create a new detection for that. And my tool also simulates um, um, WinRM and WMI uh, lateral movement. So this is WinRM. I'm using just .NET here, and now Windows API calls. Uh, and I'm going to execute Notepad.exe, and I'm going to run this on a few hosts. Uh, as you can see, it's going to, oh, let me see, so it finished here. Uh, because it's not a local admin on this host, it cannot do it. Um, and uh, you can see how you see uh, the, um, 
Notepad process. At some point, I'm going to show it here. Uh, oh, there you go. No, I think I had it there. Notepad running and its parent process is always going to be that uh, WSM prop host, which is the parent process for any um, um, child process of PowerShell remoting. Uh, and WMI, finally, uh, to kind of wrap things up, uh, how are we in time? 44, cool. Um, WMI, I use .NET once again, and I can pick ipconfig as the command. Uh, it's going to, in this case, I'm running as the uh, domain admin, so he's able to execute everywhere. Um, and you can see how it creates that uh, ipconfig process, and its parent process is wmiprdsc.exe, right? So, um, wrapping up, almost wrapping up. Um, good, we went through all demos, that's good. Um, so, more detections, right? For Kerber hosting, you can use 4769. Uh, for new services, 7045. Um, so yeah, at the end of the story, the Cyro Lama has 11 new detections in production and four in baselining uh, for testing. Um, and the Lama has learned a lot of Windows event logs and how authentication works and how they map to, um, to, um, to the uh, simulations. So pretty cool. Um, so this is just a mapping of the, the, what the tool can do with, with the attack miter framework. Um, the ones that I grade, uh, I put in orange is because, you know, the event, the technique uh, T1110, it's actually called brute force. There's no technique for password spraying. Now, I think that um, they're going to do sub techniques soon uh, in MITRE. So I, I'm thinking that password spraying should be a sub technique of brute force, right? Um, so another interesting one is that the technique privilege enumeration, where an attacker is just at going to host, authenticating to them, trying to see if he's a local admin or not. That technique doesn't exist um, in MITRE. So, um, so that'd be cool if they, they had that, right? Because I feel it's a, an interesting technique that attackers are going to use, and it makes sense. Um, then uh, I can use a lot of movement, persistent, uh, persistence. Um, yeah. So all right, what's next? So what I want to do next uh, is pretty cool. This is where it excites me, actually. Um, I, I want to run a random technique on a random host at a random day um, and day and time once a week, right? Uh, that makes sure that my detection is working. Not only my detections are working, my pipeline is working, and also my process is working. So my SOC is escalating the right thing. So I want to get to this point. And how do I get here? Uh, basically, I need a way to deploy uh, Purple Sharp uh, randomly on the environment, right? So I took a look at GPO, HCCM. They don't really do um, uh, randomizing of, um, so I'm sure that some other tools do. But what I'm doing now uh, is actually <laughs> some EDR solutions uh, have a live response, which is basically a free shell. Uh, so I'm using uh, our EDR's uh, API to, to run this on a random host, for example. Now, something interesting, important is that the tool needs to run on the context of the logged user. I want to simulate an a victim clicking on a link, getting popped, right? Um, so how do I get there? Uh, if I run uh, through that API call through my EDR, I, get a, a, I run my code in a con context of system. But just after one Google search, I found that it's really easy to, if your system, just to list all the processes and just duplicate a token and get your process uh, as that user. So that's pretty easy. It can be done. Um, it's actually already code written online that I found. Um, and I want to implement some OPSEC also because I feel that um, my SOC, if they see an alert from that same host, uh, or sorry, from that same binary every time, uh, they're going to know something's up. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to randomize the file name. I'm going to use parent process spoofing technique. You know, the, the create process API allows you to pick your parent process. So I can pick Explorer or Chrome or Firefox to, uh, to simulate an attacker, uh, a victim clicking on something. And command line spoofing also so that I don't have to pass uh, all the command and, and the EDR won't see that, right? So closing survey for the blue team. You know, how do you know if you can, can you know, do you know if you can detect a pathway, a stealth network spray attack? Boom, that's, that's how you know. Simple answer. Do you, do you know if your SOC will escalate an LSAT's read block? You can just run this and you'll know. And can you identify a host executing remote code, so, uh, remote code commands using WMI on your network? Just use this and you'll, you'll simulate safely. Um, I want to wrap up with, uh, as, as I was doing this, uh, I mapped uh, Windows 32 API calls to attack MITRE techniques. Uh, so I, I, st I want to keep working on this. I think this makes sense. I think it's going to um, going to add some extra value to uh, to um, the simulation that I'm doing. 
Uh, and yeah, that is it. Uh, right on time. Well, thanks for coming. I don't know if I have time for questions. A minute or two. Any questions? Yes, okay, good question. Uh, so the code is on GitHub, uh, but all the techniques that it supports are probably currently not on the README because you know I was at Derricon and so, but you'll, you'll see all the documentation on the GitHub, uh, on the README probably this week, uh, but the code is there. Um, but yeah, you, I'm gonna work on that next. Yes. Yes, I'll release it on my Twitter account. Uh, so yes, uh, later today I'll, yeah, for sure. All right.